Right. Well, uh, profitability is very much on uh, Fonterra's mind. It's signed up to develop a farm in India, similar to what it's done in China, saying that this is uh, a land of uh, great opportunity. Do you agree, Rod? Um, one of the um, results from the Leaders Forum, because we had interactive technology mm -hmm. so we could poll the 1,500 people in the room, was that um, they picked India as um, the fastest growing market mm -hmm. in tonnage terms, faster than China. Mm -hmm. So it is indeed a very big market. Mm -hmm. Now, should Fonterra be involved in that market? Absolutely. Um, now, I disagree with Fonterra about it investing in farms in India and China because that's not its core expertise. I think it should be investing in um, downstream manufacture um, mm -hmm. and distribution in India. Mm. Now, but I also think it's dead right um, that we should be considering how to globalise our pastoral farming system um, and, um, and turn that into a global industry. Mm. Um, but it seems to be not logical that Fonterra should be doing that. It, right. it should be elsewhere in the industry. What do you think, Bruce? There's a difference between supplying a market a product and mm. supplying them the capacity to make the product themselves. Mm -hmm. um, our core competency is that we're damn good farmers, we have a robust and dynamic industry, and there is some IP around that. Mm. The exporting of IP to other countries is just dopey. Mm. It mm. just is. You should preserve your core competitive advantage, supply them product, add value to product, capitalise on the things that they are good at in mm. terms of adding value to our core product and keep for yourself the key things that make us competitive. Sorry, I just don't like this blunt, whole thing. <laughs> every point there you're making, I would argue, is dead wrong. Mm. Um, of course you would. Uh, for, um, <laughs> first of all, world dairy consumption grows each year by more than entire New Zealand production. Mm -hmm. So there ain't no way that Fonterra, if we believe it has a future in being um, the leader of trading in global commodity products, can do that off the basis of um, New Zealand production. Yes, indeed, we have some considerable farming skills, but at land at $35,000 a, um, a hectare, we're not going to be able to compete with mm -hmm. countries where the land is $1,000 a hectare. But that's a different and, issue. No, it's not. And, that's, and that even includes places like Missouri in the United States, right? Mm. So there ain't no way we've got a future being commodity dairy farmers. Mm. But we, hang on a second, we do have a very good future um, in being central to that industry around the world, whether it be in trading on the part of Fonterra mm. or whether it be the likes of Dairy New Zealand or Wrightsons or whoever. But then we need to be doing something more sophisticated on New Zealand, in New Zealand, on our very expensive land. And the perfectly um, applicable parallel here is that not that you or I would buy a BMW 3 Series car. That's actually made in South Africa, not in Germany. Mm. So um, you'd do have... Do they do bicycles? Uh, no, you'd have to... <laughs> if you wanted a German-made BMW, you'd be buying a lot more expensive mm. one. Mm. And, and so most of BMW's R&D is in Germany. It's elsewhere around the world. So why wouldn't we want a dairy industry um, that followed um, a similar and very logical model that other industries around the world have approached? So in that sense, um, that um, New Zealand investment overseas is absolutely right. It's just that I don't think Fonterra should be doing it. I think they should be in okay. f investing downstream um, in the, okay, in the so value let's chain. Go back, let's go back to why you have this proposition. Land in New Zealand, 35,000 a mm. hectare. Land in Zimbabwe, free. A, a bad choice. Uh, choose yeah. somewhere like Brazil. Okay. Yes. Less free. $1,000 a hectare. Okay. The reality is, why is it cheap? Because there's a lot of it. Not only is there a lot of it, you have a different economic regime around it and you have a different sovereign risk and you have other instabilities that you inherit when you invest offshore. So, so but that's you... OK if you factor that into your equation. You build your dairy farm and then some nasty little dictator comes in and decides to nationalise all foreign assets. And I guess it doesn't matter in the scheme of things. Is that your argument? N not at all. Um, are you saying that New Zealand is 35 times more secure than Brazil? No, I'm saying land is grossly overpriced in New Zealand. Yes. yes. Um, so if it is grossly overpriced, how do you expect New Zealand farmers to be profitable as commodity farmers when the price of those products is set on global markets. Farmers are dopey in actually accepting the price to begin with. Farmers and are banks far... are even more dopey on lending at Far those farmers prices. are far smarter than you're giving them credit for. Mm. Um, and um, uh, no, banks are the dopey ones. They're fueling it. Yeah.
Can we just get a brief comment in uh, the last of our um, You suffer. Said It? Alan Hubbard's biographer, Virginia Green, she claims in her recently released book there was a controlled demolition of South Canterbury finance on a timetable that suited the government. What do you think, Rod? Um, I liken South Canterbury finance to a stricken aeroplane which has lost at least two of its four engines and is losing altitude very rapidly. Um, it's up to the pilot to try to pick a place to land that. Mm -hmm. um, in which, in, in this case, uh, Mr Hubbard um, proved inadequate as the pilot and uh, various other people stepped in to try to land that plane. Mm -hmm. You do have to have a controlled landing um, and so insofar it was, was very well prepared as the steps that, that went through. I have no problem with that at all. No. Now, I know Mr Hubbard, by all his reputation, is a very nice and generous man, and that's fine, um, but that still doesn't explain what happened at South Canterbury Finance. And so um, I think that's the interesting thing to read about now, not how uh, nice a man Mr Hubbard was. Right. Briefly, Bruce, what do you think? Controlled uh, demolition? Uh, to the extent South Canterbury was demolished, it was demolished in the same summary fashion as every other finance company that collapsed by self-flagellating themselves and doing dopey lending on, un on an unsustainable basis, fueled by the simple greed of bring a dollar in at 8%, lend it out at 15 and hope it gets paid back. Mm. All of the finance companies that have fallen over fell into the same trap. They mismatched their liquidity cycle, they lent on high risk, mispricing the risk, and they miscommunicated that to their investors, and the rest, as they say, is it's history. It's history. That's telling them. <laughs> Thanks. After the break, we dish the praise and box the ears, depending on what we think. Yes, it's you beauty or a bollocking. See which way the awards fall. Stay with us. Welcome back to Straight Talk. Now it's on to You Beauty, Praise, or a bollocking, the opposite. What do you have for us this week, uh, Bruce? Well, we, well, the government is attempting to encourage us to trade our way out of the malaise that we're in through exporting to prosperity. Exporting is a function of the price you get for your commodity, comma, converted into New Zealand dollars. Mm -hmm. Thus, the exchange rate is important. New Zealand's exchange rate is openly gamed by FX traders. The carry trade has a, a feature of this as well. Mm -hmm. And our currency is hugely volatile and it makes it incredibly difficult for exporters to effectively hedge. Mm -hmm. So the issue is exchange rate volatility and a persistently high cross rate to our main trading partners. This said, we don't have a lot of control over the Americans' appetite to print money, which mm -hmm. is the main dynamic in that. Mm -hmm. But it does actually... It is a challenge to Bollard, mm -hmm. as the governor of the Reserve Bank and the arbiter on monetary policy, to come up with a more balanced approach to managing our currency and our economy. So you're giving him a bollocking? He deserves a bollocking <laughs> for refusing to confront the issue that the exchange rate is just as important as price stability. Right, what do you think, Rod? Uh, Winston Peters has been talking about a ceiling for the uh, level of the dollar. Uh, how would that go? It would make him a modern-day Canute. Um, <laughs> these are forces that um, even uh, economies the size of Japan and um, the US can't control. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot we can do in terms of um, uh, modernising our monetary policy, which hasn't been um, adjusted for the best part of 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. to to, uh, and, and actually Bollard has done some good work on that. So mm. um, the core funding requirement, which is a new measure, of, um, a third new measure of uh, banks capital, um, helps um, the Reserve Bank lean against those lending forces, mm -hmm. um, which thus affects interest rates, etc. Mm -hmm. So there's lots we can do, but a, a, a ceiling is absolute madness. Mm. It only ever works to have a fixed or pegged or semi-floating currency. If you're earning more dollars, then you're spending. Mm -hmm. So until New Zealand's productivity improves and our capacity to export that productivity to others improves and our desires and appetites are reduced so that we are earning more foreign currency than we're spending, we haven't got a show 
mm. of regulating our currency because we are simply price takers. Mm. That's why a peg currency works for China. Mm. But a, a peg currency would, should, would never work for us. I, I don't think in a million years we could ever achieve it mm. because I go back to this question about the world becoming a lot more volatile place and you need incredibly flexible economies um, that can adjust. Um, and as, um, as crude as a a tool as it is, mm. a variable exchange rate um, is part of that mechanism. And mm. so um, even if you could, you would never want to peg. Rod, what about no. you? A beauty? A bollocking? Well, uh... a beauty, actually. Mm. Um, I'd have to say that um, uh, Andrew Ferrier um, performed very well on the Leaders um, Forum panel. Mm -hmm. um, there were seven people from around the world. Now, in fairness to some of the others, they were in rather narrower um, sectors of dairying and therefore didn't have as full a range of views as the chief executive of a large company like Andrew um, mm. did have. Um, but he never sort of forced himself on everybody as sort of the host, because mm. he wasn't. It was the IDF's conference. It just mm. happened to be in New Zealand. Mm. Um, but um, I, I think of all the panellists, he had the broadest range of views mm. um, and um, contributed well to that discussion. Mm. And it would be um, a side of him that certainly farmers would see um, at the likes of shareholders' meetings. But again, it's a, it was a different sort of discussion you'd see in a shareholders meeting it was more well-rounded mm. rather than focused on the co-op it was more about the world and the dairy industry mm. uh, so, so he did a good job that's great mm. I have a you beauty for former Zespri chairman Doug Voss who's urging kiwi fruit growers to stay together and handle the PSA crisis in a united way that's good advice from one who's seen the damage PSA can do in Italy that's it for us this week thanks to my guests economic commentator Rod Oram and former chairman of the Shareholders Association, Bruce Shepherd. Thanks to you too for watching. Please email your comments to country99tv.co.nz. Check out my weekly blog there, and we'll see you next time.